mm, multi-tenancy is coming. So we, we all know that it's coming for, for quite some time uh, and we started working on it and finally we will get it. So today with Mateusz, we, will, we are going to talk about uh, like what it means, where we are and where we are going to. But before we go to the topic, I just short remi reminder, Airflow serve survey is up and we are looking for all the feedback from uh, from from users and uh, questions and like explaining how they are using Airflow. It's like super important for us to get as much as many as many input as much input as possible. Uh, few words about, about us, uh, Summit already told I'm the PMC member and uh, independent open source contributor and advisor for Airflow and look, doing a lot of stuff in, in, in Airflow. I'm also a member of Apache Software Foundation, um, which I'm very proud of. Uh, Mateusz? Yeah, and my name is Mateusz Hens, and I work as a, as a software engineer at Google in Warsaw office. And for the last two days, I have been part of the Cloud Composer team, which is a Airflow managed on manage airflow on uh, gcp yeah. uh, okay so let's move on so why do we even need multi-tenancy so we see a multi-tenancy as a way of having a private space in airflow installation for for, for my ducks which means i can see and change only ducks that i own and execute them independently uh, from others uh, Uh, of course, one solution is to have a dedicated airflow per, per person or per team, but instead of uh, supporting hundreds of airflow installations, you would rather share them somehow. Uh, when you do that, you start seeing problems. For example, your colleagues' DAX PyPy dependencies conflicts with yours, or you notice that your tasks that consume a lot of memory and crashes sometimes causes other tasks to fail as well, especially if you use, for example, a salary executor. Uh, secondly, each Airflow environment brings some costs and requires database, disk space, memory, CPU, etc. And usually you don't, don't utilize them in, in 100% for 24 hours, seven days a week. So from cost perspective, it is sounds reasonable to share the Airflow installation to better utilize it and split the cost among like, many teams. And finally, if you are an administrator, then for sure you prefer to maintain a single or just a few Airflow instances than hundreds. And think about tasks like upgrades to, to newer Airflow version, changing PyPy dependencies or applying configuration changes. So where are we today? Can't we achieve this with, with just the features that we have right now? Uh, yeah, like, can't we just assign permissions to, to in the UI and in Apple web server has uh, our own airbag so we can control which person sees which ducks? Well, uh, we can, but it also only works on, it's a view on DAX, so we cannot really control the access to those DAX for, for and people people from different teams can theoretically change other DAX. Okay, then we can put different DAX in different subfolders, assign proper permissions there. Um, yeah, why not? I mean, this is a good start and some people are doing that. Uh, uh, but, you know, like when the tasks are executed, the workers are actually executing them in like randomly, like one worker can execute tasks for many different uh, teams and they can override each other data and, uh, and impact each other. Okay, but I think this could be restricted with cluster policies, right? Very good idea. And there was a talk about that, like uh, Shopify, uh, uh, Sam and Megan, they talked about that. Like, so look up this talk before, like it was like yesterday, day before yesterday, they've done exactly this and that's perfectly fine. And it works as long as your <laughs> users are friendly because everyone in Airflow has access to the database, every DAC writer right now. And you can modify the database and do whatever with it uh, what that you want. You can drop the database. So it's not as isolated as you would like it to be. Yeah, so now what are the challenges? So the, like multi-tenancy has some unique challenges. Uh, uh, 
as I mentioned before, and again, that, that was mentioned also uh, in a few talks by like John uh, from AWS yesterday, like originally Airflow model is like trust everyone. So everyone who is uh, who can access DAX can modify everything there. Uh, multi right now, uh, multiple teams can run Airflow, but they need multiple Airflow installations. Uh, all DAX, uh, are in a single physical location, so single shared folder uh, that all the DAX have to be there and have to be accessible by, by everyone. Uh, and these are they are not not separated by default. But the most important is like direct database access, because uh, lots of tasks in Airflow and lots of the implementation that people have done, they it just accesses the database and it can run any query there. Uh, including like dropping all the tables if you haven't protected that for the user who is accessing the database. Um, another challenge is that there is no real isolation between the DAX and the tasks and Airflow code. So everything is together and uh, you can actually run uh, a code of DAX and tasks uh, at the same you know, processor, the same machine that the Airflow code is run. And this code can be uh, written by anyone who who can who can access who has access to the to the to write the DAGs, and finally the access to the database is not uh, really fine grained. So once you get access and once you once your task can modify its state, it can modify its state of all the other tasks. So the isolation there is is completely missing, and that's by design. Uh, and finally, and this is something that is really important for like audits and security. Uh, there is no fine-grained access to the secrets. Airflow requires secrets to communicate to external services. And again, once you have access to secrets, you have access to all of them. So any task can read the secret that any other task needs. There is no fine-grained uh, separation. So what's the way forward and uh, path to multi-tenancy, Mateusz? Yeah, before we move to the details, let's talk a bit uh, about the approach we take to solve uh, these problems or to work on these problems. Uh, so instead of spending, sorry, instead of spending months or, or years on fixing all these issues at once, uh, we split the, the effort into smaller steps. They are, we are already planned few of them, but we uh, will talk about it in, in a few minutes and uh, work on them uh, one by one. Uh, everything we introduced must be non-breaking change. Uh, at least until we introduce Airflow 3.0. Uh, but for 2.0, if the feature uh, like this uh, breaking change or change changes the, the, the behavior, uh, then it is uh, opt-in feature. So you can enable if if you need it. But by default, it's disabled. And uh, every step must be delivered must deliver the feature that is usable. So even though it is just a part of the, the, the whole roadmap to, uh, towards multi-tenancy, it still must bring some value. And yeah, of course, even though we have ideas uh, and even some plan, there are still some gray areas and uh, we are open for any comments and any suggestions. And of course, any help is more than welcome. As you can see, as you will see soon, uh, there's still a lot of uh, to do. Uh, yeah, so every step we, we take follows these principles. So we don't want any big bangs. If step can be split into smaller features, then we do it. And we use feature flags, uh, usually a con new configuration option in Airflow to enable the feature, making sure the uh, change is neutral uh, to Airflow if flag is disabled. And uh, we cooperate with many stakeholders. As I said, I am from Google. But there are folks who are engaged in this effort for Airbnb, Astronomer, Cloudera, or Amazon. And we run semi-regular meetings to provide status updates and also discuss about new ideas or open topics. We have recordings and meetings notes from previous one. I think you should be able to find them on Airflow dev list if you are interested. Okay, so let's move forward. Uh, when we first started to think about this topic in Google, uh, we really didn't like the mixing execution of Airflow code and DAC code, and the fact that all the components has unlimited access to, to the database. And uh, yeah, soon we found that the community shares similar concerns. 
Uh, so we found that we can split the components that, that are in Airflow into two groups, trusted uh, and untrusted. Uh, for trusted, we categorize any code or any component uh, that comes from the Airflow community. In Google, we can do security privacy review on it before we publish it for, for to, uh, and integrate with our product. Uh, it means that it can't mix uh, the code from, from Airflow and any custom plugins or PyPy package. And this component shouldn't even have access to DAC files and not to even try to open and execute them even by, by, by mistake. And uh, finally, as the code is fully auditable, uh, it seems safe for it to have access to Airflow database because we are sure what the, what the, what the code is executed and uh, what change it brings to the uh, Airflow database. On the other side, we have uh, untrusted components, uh, which executes user code or custom plugin PyPy packages. To run DAGs, they, of course, must have access to the uh, DAG storage. But on the other hand, the access to Airflow database should be limited. Uh, when we discussed it with the community, we found that there may be different definitions of what is trusted and what is untrusted. Uh, for Cloud Composer uh, or any, I believe, managed Airflow uh, service providers, only the community code is considered trusted. So nothing that comes from the end user, even, even if it's an uh, end user administrator. So code like plugins, packages, and that, that, that they can't be considered trusted from Google perspective. Uh, we found that there are like three problematic features. Uh, timetables, which are executed in scheduler, uh, which other than that is, is trusted. Uh, trigger with a custom trigger definition and web server plugins. This either must be blocked for user configuration or made untrusted. From user perspective, uh, there are two personas, Airflow admin that is able to install runtime by plugins and PyPy uh, dependencies and DAC author uploading the code. Yeah, on the other side of this, uh, uh, we have standalone Airflow and Jarek. Yes, so uh, I'm representing the, the other point of view where we have just uh, somebody managing the installation of Airflow. And then the separation is, is easier because you have an Airflow admin who can manage the, the who can manage the timetables, triggers, web server plugins, and the runtime plugins and packages. And DAG authors are only uh, can only manage the DAG code, and they cannot access any of those. So this is a little bit simpler, uh, but that's that's where you have like on-premise installation uh, rather than a managed managed one. Uh, okay, so there are various degrees of multi-tenancy and you will see that the, the whole multi-tenancy is is very layered approach uh, the deeper we go the, the more complex things we have to implement so for now what and this is have this is done now so this is something that we can use now into 3.0 we, we completely separated the access to the admins and separate and their DAG authors code so the, you can uh, make sure that ne that the DAG code uh, is never executed in the same context as the Airflow code. Uh, this is something that is already done with, uh, uh, with what Mateusz will tell in a moment. Uh, the next thing, the next level of separation is like you know, when you have different teams, each team would like to probably use different dependencies and not like because they want to run different kinds of workloads. Uh, and this is not something yet done but this is the another layer of uh, of getting deeper into the multi-tenancy stack uh, the next step is like direct no direct access to the database uh for DAG authors so they shouldn't be able to access database directly so this is like then uh, the multi-tenancy becomes like more and more secure with every every of those steps uh, and finally or getting getting even deeper uh we don't want we want to get this fine-grained access to the secrets uh, so that the DAGs and tasks executed can only access the secrets that they are entitled to and finally maybe the kind of like the last 
dream uh, uh, level of the of the multi-tenancy is that each task is standalone it doesn't access anything outside it gets everything to run all the secrets all the configuration uh, it is part of the task so this is the kind of dream that we want to uh, implement sometime in the future this is where we are going to uh, few words about the mm, uh, the um, the architecture that we have of Airflow. Uh, for those who don't remember, reminder: so we have scheduler and Airflow 2.2 had scheduler with a DAC processor in. It access DAC. There are workers which are accessing those DACs and executing them. There is a metadata database which is uh, which is the central central part. Uh, and there is trigger and web server using the database. So this is the this is what we had in Airflow 2.2. <laughs> and that's a little bit of leak legacy, uh, and which we attempted to remove first. So first of all, we think like, like the DAG workers and the DAG processor, which parses the DAGs, should be part of the per tenant installation rather than the, the, the shared infrastructure. So the scheduler, DB, trigger, and web server, they are kind of shared infrastructure. The DAC processing and DAC parsing should be separated out. And this is where Mateusz comes in and explain how we've done that, because this is already a done deal. Yes, yes some, some work is uh, already done. The first step that we implemented is separating DAC processor uh, from scheduler. Uh, so in Airflow 2, scheduler runs an internal process which parses the DACs and adds them to the database. The scheduler job itself just checks the database and schedules tasks for execution. And uh, we saw that these two processes are on the opposite sides of the trusted versus untrusted uh, split. So uh, in Airflow 2.3, it's now possible to run DAC processor fully independently from scheduler on different hosts with different security boundaries, etc. Uh, as a side effect, the DAC processor can no longer affect scheduler work. So yeah, in Cloud Composer, we see sometimes bugs from our customers that it happens that the scheduler job is uh, starts from the uh, start from the uh, DAC processor expanding too much CPU on the uh, when when the airflow is uh, overloaded. Yeah, so the, so the right now you can execute that processor uh, fully independently from ROM scheduler. And this solves the first problem that uh, Jarek mentioned. Uh, we have a scheduler which is now which now fully meets the definition of trusted component. So in scheduler we execute only airflow code. It doesn't have access, actually doesn't need any access to DAC storage. Yeah, so we have the first success in the uh, long list. Uh, yeah, just a just, uh, few words on what was actually done uh, inside the uh, DAC processor separation effort. So even this change may look simple. We had to do some uh, refactorings and design decisions. Uh, so first, uh, we moved the zombie detection that was previously in DAC processor, and uh, we moved it to, to schedule our job, which actually sounds like a proper place for this functionality. Uh, secondly, uh, so far, scheduler send callbacks for execution to DAC processor through multi-processing pipe. But of course, it is not possible if uh, DAC processor is running on a different host. So uh, with, with this, uh, with, with the DAC processor separated, callbacks uh, are sent through database and scheduler puts them there. The DAC processor just falls for the database on some interval. And yeah, of course, this is the breaking change. Uh, for Airflow, so uh, to use it, you must set the con new configuration flag, which is disabled by default. When you set it, the scheduler will no longer start internal DAC processor processes, as it did for in 2.2. Uh, but instead, you can run it yourself with a new CLI command, and of course, it has some more parameters. If you are interested, you can uh, you can check some details in uh, AIP43. Uh, you can also find some PRs that were uh, submitted for for this change. And uh, just just let me uh, in, interrupt you for a moment, because this is this also shows shows how 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 we work with the community. Uh, so this is this is implemented right now in a, as a, like it's possible to run, but the deployment like the Helm chart that we have in community doesn't really support it yet. 
but we already have someone uh, from the community who is working on on making it possible to uh, to run and that's the baby steps that we are showing like we implemented something now we get the community to start using it and and improving that the, they already found like one bug that uh, in you cannot really run it in a in a docker container that well and we will fix it but the fact that we got into the hands of the users before it was like fully completed is great because we can continue and, and improve that. Yes, thanks, Eric. And uh, uh, one last thing uh, to be done. Uh, yeah, it's still under development, uh, still running some, some tests, uh, but I hope to push it soon, is to run multiple DAX processes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, multiple DAC processes, uh, each processing DACs from a different directory, and of course they can run independently, um, and uh, yeah, make, making sure that they don't, don't interrupt uh, with each other. Okay, so this is uh, where are we now, but uh, of course we have ideas for the near and far future, and let's talk about them. Uh, Jarek? Mm -hmm. Okay. So first of all uh, now the runtime is isolation so uh, as we explained before uh, the duck processor and the workers they belong to the multi-tenant to the tenant code and uh, when we want to run uh, the code for multiple tenants uh, both duck processing and execution of the tasks should happen in the same environment because they might need the same libraries or might need some special resources so, and different teams might need different uh, uh, different dependencies, for example, or different resources. So uh, for that, the DAC processor separation was the first step. And the second step, and uh, first of all, is to, to, to complete it, to complete it in the way that you can let, run, for example, multiple, multiple DAC file processors, one per team, and each DAC processor could run in their own runtime. And for this running on the different runtime, we also have, and that's the work contributed by, by Ping and Kevin from Airbnb. Uh, and we are working on that still together. They are working on that and we're reviewing and helping um, is to make sure that uh, the same task can be parsed and executed in the same, in, 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 a, in the, in different runtime, in like a separate Docker container, basically. Uh, so we are working together and this is a true team effort. So when we combine this separate DAC processor and Docker runtime, uh, it will allow for separating the environments, separating the, the way how the DACs are, uh, or the, the libraries that the, the DACs are parsed and executed. And, and the same uh, Docker runtime will be shared between processor and worker. This is the easiest way how to make sure that uh, those, those are separated. This was like common ask, maybe not super related to the multi-tenancy, but common ask like how we can make sure that Okay, this task run with those dependencies and that task with, and with those dependencies. So this Docker runtime and the DAC file processor separation together, they will allow that per team. Yeah, and that's the kind of that great, great level of that. And uh, the thing that like it's theoretically it's possible even now if you would like to configure it, but it's not easy to configure. So you would have to really do some fine tuning and 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 your own. Um, rules that you have to set on writing the DAGs. So the idea is like that we want to implement it in the way that it should be easily configurable per, per tenant. So you should be able just to say, okay, this task, even particular task should be executed in this environment and this in that, and, and that should be working out of the box. This is, this is the goal that we want to achieve. So once we do that, and we don't know when exactly this will happen. We, we are aiming for these baby steps and, and, and gradual implementation. Once we do that, we will be able to achieve something that uh, that is the first step, like separating uh, actually tenants from each other. So you, you will have multiple tenants that uh, will be able to manage their environment separately or uh, the environments can be managed for them actually. Uh, the next step, and this is the this is something that I was mostly uh, designing together with Mateusz and the uh, Google team uh, initially, uh, or till today, uh, is the database isolation. As we all know, and we repeated that before, every uh, tasks have access to the whole database, and that's 
not good <laughs> so we what we want to want to do is like make sure that workers and DAC processors so those things that belong to the tenant they can only access database for very uh, selected operation and selected part of the, of the of the database and only perform operations that we want it to execute uh, so we introduced the concept of internal api uh, which is different than the REST API. Uh, they might run in the same uh, like web server, but might be also separated, but they are a little bit different because they need a little bit different properties. Uh, it will allow to authorize the workers and the DAC file processor to access a specific functionality of the database uh, modifications and, and retrieval. So only part of subset of database operations will be available via internal API. And we made an inventory of that. We know what we, what we need to implement. Um, uh, for now, it doesn't have like, like super fine grained access to the metadata day database. So like every task will be when we'll be able to access secrets, it will be able to access all of them. This is not yet targeted by the internal API work that we are aiming uh, and AIP 44, which implements that or which, which designs that. Uh, and once we get it, this is the next step. So there is more green, uh, less, less problems that you can see. Uh, so we will be able to access the, uh, like replace the access from the, uh, from the, from the workers with no direct database access and back processor, they will be able to access the true internal API. They will be access the database and modify the database. This is the goal. Uh, what's the status? Uh, first pass of reviews passed already. So we did a number of reviews and discussions how this should look like. We have very well uh, concept, very well designed concept, how it should look like, how it should be implemented. Uh, uh, with some kind of RPC-like interface. Uh, we haven't yet chosen the actual technology. We have two candidates, uh, GRPC and Thrift, and we have to do some performance testing on those to see which one we will finally choose. And that's on me. Uh, I've, been, I've been a little bit delaying that because of the huge amount of work that Ash was talking about with, uh, with 2.3.0, with dynamic task mapping. We didn't want to add even more complexity <laughs> to, to make it to make it even more uh, potentially uh, pot even more potential bugs to fix. So right now we are going to uh, increase the efforts now and do this uh, con continue this proof of concept and implement implement uh, the the rest of that. And we want to do in in the way that uh, the code will not be duplicated. So we will not have separate. Like we will not have separate code to do the database direct database access uh, uh, because like we want to again do the feature flag so we want to be able to enable uh, direct db access uh, if somebody wants to uh, or uh, enable di database isolation if somebody wants it but we want to still continue running the old way so if you don't want it uh, and you have good reasons not to do it, you will not be you you will not enable that. But we want to avoid the code duplication. So we want to make sure that those RPC and internal codes are pretty much uh, the same code, the same execution. Uh, proof of concept is in progress. Uh, and then we have uh, so one thing that is uh, will happen there. We will in, uh, we will add a mechanism that will uh, temporary access. Uh, give give the temporary access to workers and DAC processor to be able to run those um, those database calls because this is like the part that that currently we don't have currently the access like from for the REST API is for users for like real users and now we we are talking about executing tasks and uh, parsing files which are not humans yeah they are some uh, some entities like service providers or uh, service accounts uh, so we have to simulate. A similar approach like service accounts in uh, Google Cloud or, or Amazon Web Services. Uh, the next step, uh, there is a, this fine grained access to metadata da database. And uh, just, to sh just to show you also where we are, this is not yet fully defined. We discussed, like, we know we have ideas, we have, uh, like, we know how this can be done. But we haven't made the decisions because we just want to uh, do it gradually and uh, discuss in more detail when we are closer because we don't want to get, you know, discuss it and like half a year later start implementing that. Um, 
So discussions must must still happen. Uh, the temporary tokens will for sure be used. So what we we uh, implement now in AAP forty four will be the, the kind of base to implement that. But the the idea is like that: uh, whenever task is executed, it can only access the resources that are needed to execute that particular task, and that might mean different things. So, like one thing is like um, uh, the DAG task background XCOM. So those are the, the kind of let's say airflow runtime. So we want to make sure that the task cannot modify status because, like, if, if you know like how airflow works under the hood, there is like this mini scheduler running in the task at the end, for example, and it can schedule uh, follow up tasks after your uh, after you um, finished your your job. So actually, tasks uh, under the hood can access the uh, internal runtime and can modify the internal runtime. So we want to make sure that in the future those tasks can only actually do the job of, uh, that they are supposed to do and not like currently you could potentially uh, from the task uh, schedule task that is completely unrelated yeah, or modify the status of another task which we don't want to do uh, or write an XCOM <laughs> entry for another task pretend that the task was right it was doing like produced some data yeah that's that's a bit scary <laughs> But we want to uh, want to get rid of that. So we make sure that the isolation is on the fine-grained access that you don't access the or don't don't change the runtime that you shouldn't supposed to. Uh, initially, it will be no uh, secrets isolation separation. We don't know yet exactly how to do this secret isolation. There are several ideas. So either you could do it also by accessing specific secret. Or and that's that's another and and I re, I think it's a very very powerful and 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 good idea I think is like that when task execute they already have those secrets that they are accessing uh, with them they don't have to reach out to get like configuration they will just be started and they know already what kind of secrets uh, they should access because it was done before like those those secrets were always, were retrieved were retrieved before when the task is executed. And that goes very well. Uh, and that's something that we haven't defined yet, but that goes uh, hand in hand. And yesterday, uh, Andrew Godwin, Godwin, he was talking about the deferrables, deferrables and the way how we are thinking about the future of Airflow and the deferrables. Uh, and uh, like part of this, like, like isolated workloads or workloads that you can just submit and execute. And, and that, that comes very well here. The ideas are there. We don't know the details yet how we are going to do that. But at least, like we have some good ideas uh, that this is the direction we want to take. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's the resources. Uh, so right now, the challenges with this fine grade access to those resources, like how to map particular DAX to particular secrets that you need, uh, like you don't know exactly. Uh, you have to parse the code, the Python code, to understand which uh, which resources will be used. And sometimes, if you want to dynamically retrieve them, then probably you have to execute the code actually to, to know that. So we have to limit these capabilities a little bit, but on the other hand, make them, they, them um, controllable. And that goes also hand in hand. And that's why also like implementing it now makes little sense. It go, goes hand in hand with the, uh, the future of Airflow, which is the, the data lineage and understanding which data sets you are operating on because data set is intrinsically connected with the uh, with the authorization that needs to, uh, needs to be done uh, and then if you know that your task is, is is using particular data set you know which authorization you need and that this will this information will be available is not yet like not easily parsable but uh, when the data lineage is implemented uh, uh, and this uh, this these concepts uh, are, are are implemented it will be much easier that's why it's also like deferred for later uh, deferred yeah uh, so we could actually see uh, like um, uh, go together with the overall vision for airflow and and make sure that we are not implementing something that will be incompatible with the, with, with the other approaches so this is this is something that we it will, it will likely require some changing of the DAG definition uh, but that goes again with the data lineage uh, approach uh, likely and again, it's not finalized, so uh, any well, any input is welcome. Any discussions, we will be discussing that on dev list on the calls for sure for the next uh, years, uh, I think, or <laughs> months at least. Uh, 
Uh, so we will require some kind of tenant entity for the database. And again, as I mentioned, embedding the credential in the workload is probably something that we will implement eventually. Like that, that sounds like that sounds like a great idea that you can just submit a workload and have everything you need to execute it because because then you can kind of package it and then whenever you execute a, uh, a worker you don't even have to have access to any you know database anything you just have everything you need to execute it this is this is actually quite cool so uh when you have this fine grade access to resources uh the next step so the next green card green ticks and we are we are very very close to the final goal goal uh I think the last part, uh, which we haven't discussed yet at all, almost, is like currently you do have some ways of how to uh, make your DAGs only available in the UI for uh, for this uh, user and not that user, but it's nowhere close to what I would imagine it, it, it is like. You should be able to say, okay, this DAG or this task uh, or this DAG actually is available only for this tenant. That's it. Uh, and that for the, this tenant. It's not there. Like right now you have to do some complex permission settings and like, you know, synchronization of permissions, maybe connect it with your uh, LDAP or group configuration, but it's far from straightforward. And some... Uh, yeah. yeah, we actually, in Cloud Composer, uh, we are about to launch uh, that actually the, the feature like that, like that. It's called perform the auto registration. You may check the release notes for the like upcoming releases to actually uh, see it coming. Uh, and uh, yeah, actually assign the permissions based on the on the folder and uh, properly uh, like sets which which user groups has access to them. And we based our approach on DAG policies, so that there's some some custom. Uh, custom code there, but of course, uh, we'll be very happy to integrate with any Airflow native solution if, if it exists. Yeah, so so we also learn, like, um, again, the, the, the Airflow Summit is, uh, and uh, listening to all the others who are, uh, all, the, all the users as well, who are using Airflow, that's, that's what we've learned. What people did to overcome the limitations, like the Shopify and now Cloud Composer, and we're working together on, on making sure that we are addressing all the different use cases, because, like, Airflow is used in so many different ways, and we have to listen to the to all the users and try to see uh, and make it a really a product. Like I have this saying that okay, it's easy to implement something like uh, very specific implementation of something. Yeah, then if you might want to make it reusable, it costs three times as much. Then if you make it a product, then it's like three times the three times, which is like nine times as expensive. Uh, to do so we have to do it right because we know it's going to cost a lot of uh, effort to implement it and we want to make sure to learn from from all the users who wants to use it and that's why you know asking questions and i see a lot of questions coming about the multi-tenancy and people explaining how they are uh, planning their use cases we want to listen to that for sure it's not like we will not we will not tell you like it's there um, like it will be there uh, like we will, we are listening, but getting the feedback is, is super important. Listening to what others are doing. So no AIP yet. Some challenges again: mapping DAGs and tasks to to, to user groups or tenants. Uh, something that Composer did on the or looking at their own AI, AIM implementation, I guess, uh, interacting with the with the Google Cloud Platform uh, authorization and authentication mechanism, and permission management. Uh, it will likely require some changes in the DAG definition again. We don't know, but likely we have to somehow make sure that a particular DAG is assigned somewhere, maybe in an easy way. Like, you know, we have those dec decorators. We, we, we experiment with different, we can experiment with different approaches and see which will be the easiest to use and easiest to, uh, to modify in the future. Uh, and some kind of tenant entity we need to we need to have because we don't have it right now. We don't have like a group of people. But there is no such concept really in, in in Airflow yet. And so, once we get there, well, all is done. I mean, hopefully, so we will get a really fully multi-tenant solution that you will be able to implement uh, and get some separation, both the security on the tenant level on the execution of runtime 
but also on the like accessing the database, also on the accessing the information about the like the exec about the DAGs themselves from the UI, uh, and fully trusted components like scheduler, database, trigger, and internal API, which will be able to access eff efficiently the database and uh, and be able you will be able to manage them centrally, while the rest will be uh, not only isolated in terms of security but also isolated in terms of runtime environment uh, means dependency but also and that's something that we haven't mentioned but it kind of goes uh hand in hand with what we discussed is like if you have this separation and if those are separate processes separate runtime then you can also make sure and this this is a uh, this is something that also our users were mentioning a lot like how to make sure that you are not uh, taking resources uh, from the other tenant yeah, like you will be able to assign certain set of resources to one tenant like cpu memory whatever you want for one tenant and everything that is executed by that tenant will be using those resources the other tenant will be using their own resources and then uh, you will be able to manage them th them separately and they will not step into each other's toes and that's uh, that's the kind of uh, the great thing for both companies like uh, like uh, composer astronomer uh, AWS who are running managed service, but also great for uh, anyone who like Shopify uh, manage it internally for their own teams on premises and wants to also manage effectively different teams. Uh, now Airflow 3.0. Uh, well, <laughs> we were <laughs> thinking with Mateusz what uh, what to tell here. Uh, what's the even farther future and like what's gonna happen next and we mostly have open questions uh we don't have answers on that uh, and a lot of discussions there uh were also happening are also happening right at the, the devil so rafael bigat from from composer team uh he, he started a thread um last week about like the the db isolation like there are some users who are actually uh, who actually want to access the data uh, base directly. They have some queries they wrote. They have some uh, cleanups and like what what not. Like it's there. If we disable the isolate, if we enable the isolation mode, uh, well, they won't be able to do that. They they will have to do it through the REST API. But maybe we don't have enough. Uh, API endpoints uh, or batch endpoints that will enable them to do like on the, on the in bulk. We don't know, but we have to figure out, and this is something that is being up in the air, like the discussion, like how we're going to do that. So uh, give some way to our users to make the transition possible. So it's easy. I, I, I often see that happening. Like people think, okay, this is the final architecture. This is going to work. Uh, but now we are in this in this in this step like like okay how to move from here to there i don't know i mean this is perfect architecture we want to go there but we don't know how to get there i think this is like our goal also or our task to figure out um, the transition and the the journey of people from using the traditional way like direct access to the database into the the isolation mode in the in the way that it will allow them to transition also progressively and smoothly and without you know like big bang yeah because this is this is this is not something that is happening in in reality you don't expect people to make a big bang approach we've learned that with airflow 2 which was like a huge migration and people still after two years some didn't migrate because they are afraid of the big bang and we don't want to do that uh so uh question is like should we have continue keeping the feature flag to enable disable that in the future or should be multi-tenancy by default we don't know uh we think well we don't know like this is completely open question like how much how much of this multi-tenancy is really a common task and how much how much people will, will benefit from keeping it simple and without the multi-tenancy Maybe both solutions will be uh, will be good at the same time, and just keeping the feature flag. We don't know. We will. We want your feedback as well. Once we implement that, this is something that we want to hear our users. Uh, and uh, finally, whether we want to uh, allow people to opt out from that, it's a bit. Uh, I 
I think it's more like four zero question, not three zero, because I don't think <laughs> opting out in three zero would be even even possibility. But let's see, uh, let's see how uh, what our user tell us. Okay, that's uh, that's it. We are, I think, on time. Uh, now time for Q and A. And reminder, survey. We want to hear from you. We want to you know know. Well, how you want to use Airflow, how you're using it now, what you missed, everything you can ask and answer the question, question questions and give your own feedback uh, in the survey.